Uh, we're really uh, privileged to have Eric Canavan with us tonight, and then Nicole. Um, Eric is going to talk about the, phys the physical therapy that goes along with um, with these issues that surround Chiari and Ehlers Danlos sy syndrome, the craniovertebral hypermobility. And he has a unique experience. He, he graduated in or was graduated in 1997 with his physical therapy degree and has 15 years of experience dealing with traumatic brain injury, acute orthopedic injuries, and a 20-year experience with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome with his wife and two children who are involved. He has a profound and intimate understanding of all the issues. And um, having the ability to reverberate with Nicole, who is a brilliant uh, also a brilliant physical therapist. I think that they have really broken new ground on this, and what he has to say, I think, is probably some of the most uh, important and original work on this subject. So, uh, Eric, thank you. I've had to deal with the healers Danlos. I never learned about healers Danlos in college. It's just not taught. So the first time I ever experienced it, was when Nicole was being diagnosed. Uh, and you, you all know how it goes as far as having to go from one doctor to the next doctor to the next doctor. It took years to actually for her to get diagnosed. So in the meantime, what do I do? I'm trying to find things to help her out, help the kids out. So I take courses, manual therapy courses, to try to figure out if there's ways that I can use what I know to help out my family and get them through some of the orthopedic or neurological things that they may be uh, dealing with. <coughs> One thing i found, though, is that with the, uh, the, the manual techniques that they're teaching, they have to be modified. Uh, they apply mostly for your regular outpatient orthopedic patient, but with the ehlers there's they weren't teaching that. And in, there's special considerations, otherwise you may do more damage than, than good. Yeah. All right, All right. common right. perception of physical therapy. Teach exercises, strength training, functional training, which is doing stairs, teaching how to lift, and pain relief. So how we do this, we give exercises, we can use modalities. So if you have a ultrasound, electric, uh, electrical stimulation, everybody's familiar who's ever had physical therapy with that type of unit. ADL training, activities of daily li uh, lift, activities of daily living. So we're teaching how to uh, lift, go up and down stairs, how to walk correctly. Then we may do some bracing, uh, off the shelf bracing or taping. So are these uh, are going to be effective with EDS and Chiari? Uh, Rambaut did a study, uh, or a cross-sectional study, on uh, 79 Ehlers-Danlos patients that uh, with the hypermobility type that were treated with medication, mm -hmm. surgery, and uh, physical therapy. And they found, uh, or they wanted to dis uh, find the effects that these modalities had on improving their function. What they found was that 92% were using pain for uh, medications, in particular analgesics. Uh, 56 underwent surgery, and uh, 41 were enrolled in a PT program that consisted of neuromuscular exercise, electrotherapy and massage. So 33% of the people who had surgery reported positive incomes. Not a very good number. And uh, 63, a little over 63% who were enrolled in physical therapy reported positive incomes or outcomes. Again, not very good numbers. So uh, their conclusion was that the uh, EDS patients had uh, complaints, of many complaints and impaired functional status and that the surgical and physical therapy outcomes are disappointing in large percentage, which shows that there's a strong need for evidence-based therapy. Evidence-based being what you're doing is proven to work. You've done studies, it shows it works. So why are the results so poor from physical therapy? You know, I, this is all I do all day, I do physical therapy. Why, why didn't this work? They did neuromuscular exercise, it makes sense. You're trying to teach the muscles how to control how the joints are moving. Uh, massage, a uh, very well-documented way to help relieve pain. Electrotherapy, again, another well-documented uh, way to relieve some pain temporarily. But what about manual techniques? Uh, it says massage, but massage is just a small part of manual. 
There's so many other things that they can do. Uh, so when I'm looking at the study again, I'm thinking, okay, so did these therapists consider, when they're teaching these people to do exercise, how, how the joints are moving? Are they moving normally, in a, in a normal way that they were designed to move? Uh, and recently, there's, I mean, relatively recently, there's been a, a push to incorporate more manual therapy into our treatment protocols. Uh, but they are time consuming. You're spending a lot of time with people when you're doing manual therapy with them. But they have been shown to be more effective than just exercise alone. So when you combine manual and exercise together, it seems to work much better. Uh, Harris did a study of uh, patients who had non-acute AC joint pain, AC joint being right at the top of the shoulder here. And uh, they, instead of just treating that, they, they alone, they used uh, manual therapy to treat the neck, the thoracic spine, uh, the shoulder blade, a lot of different components that actually make up the whole shoulder girdle and not just the one joint. And uh, what they found was that there was a statistically significant and clinically meaningful improvement in all the outcome measurements. They used the shoulder and pain index, uh, disability index, which is an outcome study. We use that in our office. Um, an outcome assessment tool is basically you give the person a questionnaire, they fill it out, it has questions pertaining to their ability and, and such, and uh, give it to them uh, you know, maybe a few sessions later and we compare the numbers, see how they did. So, and it's a very, it's a well-researched uh, outcome assessment tool. Uh, workers' Comp uses it a lot in their uh, studies. So why, why are people considering manual therapy? Sometimes it's the education of the therapist. Uh, there's so many techniques out there. You spend years taking continuing edu education classes just to learn these techniques. And to actually become proficient with them, it takes thousands of clinical hours of experience. You, you really have to learn how to use it. It's, it's not just I take a course for a weekend, I go do it in the clinic, and I'm already an expert. It's not like that. It takes hours and hours and hours of practice and hands-on uh, to get used to that. Uh, time constraints, like I said before, sometimes there are, uh, the manual techniques do take more time especially if you're working in a high volume clinic where you have to see four people an hour. Uh, you're not going to spend a lot of time working one on one with someone. You're usually passing and giving them exercises and you're just monitoring. We don't have that. Mm -hmm. Then there's the reimbursement issues. Uh, you know, if you're seeing fewer people, then your reimbursement's going down. But I, I think quality of care is going to supersede that. So when we're treating the EDS or the Chiari patients, some things that if you want to keep in mind, especially for the therapist, we have to listen carefully to all the complaints and we're not going to dismiss any symptoms. No matter how small, every little bit of information helps. Uh, we need to know these things. Uh, when we're treating, we want to make sure that we're normalizing the joint mechanics. Uh, if a joint's designed to move a certain way, we want to make sure that it is moving that way and it's not being influenced by muscle spasm or pain in some way. And we can improve the muscular control of the joints. Uh, there's a concept called regional interdependence. Uh, Wiener described it as uh, seemingly unrelated impairments in a remote anatomical region may contribute to or be associated with the patient's primary complaint. What this says is Say you have back pain. Am I going to just look at the back or should I look at the whole person? I'm going to look at the hips, the knees. I want to see how they're moving because if it's, if I'm just treating the back and I'm not treating the actual problem, I could spend six months on a back. It's not going to get any better until I actually take care of that primary problem. So, you know, when we're looking at uh, like a Chiari situation where someone's coming in and I need them to do some uh, neck exercises. But I can't get them to do that because they've got a raging headache. I have to address that headache first before I can have them do any exercise or I'm not going to get anywhere. So I may have to look lower. Maybe we'll look at the sacrum. Maybe there's something going on there that's influencing the way that the neck is moving. If I can take care of that, I can get them to do that neck exercise if I want to do it. Uh, Vaughn did a study or did a case report about a 25 year old female runner had knee pain, four and, week, four and a half weeks duration. When they examined the knee, they tested the ligaments, they're checking the cartilage, 
they didn't find anything wrong. The only thing they found was some tenderness, at the, tenderness at the palpation, at the medial knee. But when they looked closer up towards the, the pelvis, they found some asymmetry in the bony landmarks. So he did one single session of uh, manual therapy procedures to the, uh, to the pelvic area uh, on the same side of the knee pain. And the patient was able to return to running uh, further knee pain after one therapy session. If I could do this on every one of my patients, I would be a therapist of the year. If I, this is pretty much, it doesn't happen that often, but I do know that when I do treat the whole person, the whole body, and look at the whole way the person's moving, if I can take care of a lot of those little things, it makes my treatment time way shorter. Instead of a person stay, coming in for 12 visits and they're getting out of there, eh, I can get them done in six. And they're much happier. They're not coming back in. Um, but it just illustrates the point that you really need to look at the whole person, not just one part. So manual therapy. These are a few of the techniques I'm going to talk about, and I'm just going to glaze over them. These, I could spend two days on each one of those. We don't have two days for that. Uh, muscle energy is the first one. This one I use quite extensively. Um, it's developed by Fred Mitchell. It's a positional technique uh, that helps us balance out muscles. What you see is when a person is moving it through, a, a, through a motion, let's say the thoracic spine, you have several muscle groups working on that, that or they're influencing that one joint. If I have too much pull on one side and not enough pull on the other side, it's going to go the way of the too much pull. So that can cause problems, especially if you're looking at like a cervical spine and they're trying to do flexion and the one side is pulling too hard instead of flexing nicely like this, they're going into a torticollis. That needs to be addressed. We, yeah. Sorry. We don't know what torticollis. torticollis is like a twisting or curvature of the neck. So what I need to do is I have to decrease the muscle spasm or the pull on one side and increase it on the other. So I've got picture here where the person's in a, that position and I have to bring them through three planes of motion flexion and extension, side bending and rotation. So in this one I'm addressing the thoracic spine and I've moved her forward into flexion over to side bending and rotated a little bit. I've gone right up to the barriers and what I'll do at the next point is I'll have them push back towards me and what that does is it inhibits the side that's too tight and it facilitates the side that needs a little more of. Uh, we call it reciprocal inhibition. I'm not going to get into the technical part of that. But um, the nice thing about this is it's patient directed. I'm not manipulating. I, I hate that word, manipulate. It's just it's so aggressive. I don't, we don't do that with Ehlers Danlos or Chiara. It's just not. But in doing this, the patient's just pushing against me with whatever they feel comfortable doing. I just resist them. I don't have to push hard. I'm not doing anything fast. They're doing it within pain-free motions. And special considerations for this, I have to be easy on the isometric, which means their, their contraction towards me. I don't want them pushing too hard. I tell them to push into me. Don't push through me. Okay? And with them, I'm always checking the joint position because if, if it's pulled a little too much, I may cause them irritation in the other direction. Uh, another technique is mulligan. This is developed by Brian Mulligan. He's a, a physical therapist out of New Zealand. If you ever get a chance to see a video on this guy, he's, he's really entertaining. He's a really nice guy. Um, his, some of his techniques are called mobilizations of movements, nags and snags. You don't have to worry about that. Uh, his, he wants to identify loss of joint movement. And that's not so much particular with EDS, but what's good for them is the pain associated with movement or the specific functional activity. If they're moving through a, a, a range and it hurts, they're not going to do it. So you may be hypermobile, but if you're hurting in this range, we need to get you into a more functional range. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to apply a force to help them along. In this picture here, I've got a, a stabilization belt around her shoulder. And I'm using that to pull back slightly as she's moving her arm through normal range. 
and it's always completed in a pain-free range. We never do it with pain. I was going to show a, show you how to do it on a wrist. So, and Nicole, as she's going into wrist extension back like this, let's say she's got that carpal instability and her carpal bones aren't moving the way they should and she's getting pain right here. What I would do is apply a gentle uh, force one way and then another way and then have her move through that motion pain free. We would repeat it several times and then I could tape her to make sure to have that stay that way. So if she goes home and she's doing dishes or, or whatever, that force is still being applied. It's making it pain free. Okay? And it's amazing too because he's done this for me many times and I'll have been in so much pain for for so long and waiting for come home from work and fix this. He always walks in the door and I say, fix this, fix this, fix this. Yeah, and um, everything he does to to get my joint, no matter how small it is, even the little carpal bones or tarsal bones in the feet back in a place, he does it in a pain-free way. And he lets the body do the work, my body. Not, not, he puts the pressure on it, but he tells me in what way, what direction I need to move for that bone to slide itself back where it wants to go into its spot so they can all work in harmony again. And then that's the same with the last technique you talked about too, the, the pain free range. Yeah, and, and the nice thing with these is, is these can be taught for them to do themselves. I can teach Nicole how to glide that herself so that it can, she can have nice carryover in between treatment sessions. And again, I can tape if I want. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about taping later. Uh, strain, counter strain, and pain relief phenomenon. Uh, this is developed by Lawrence Jones. It's again a passive positional technique. Uh, this one, what we're trying to do is we're going to identify uh, tender points. You see, this works really well with people that have RSD. Um, there's a lot of link between RSD and healers damn well. So anybody who's had any chronic pain can develop RSD, which is, who's familiar with RSD? Anybody? Okay. Um, what it basically is, is the nervous system is not responding correct in an appropriate way to a pain stimulus. People with RSD have debilitating pain. Uh, you touch them, the wind blows by them. Their leg or their the area is just in constant pain. You see uh, changes in, in color of the, of the skin. Um, they're very, very tender. So this works really nice because I'm going to put a pressure, I'm going to find a pressure point or a, a, a tender point and I'm going to move that joint into a position where that point is no longer painful. I'll have them grayed out. So give me, you know, zero to 10, 10 being the worst. And if I find a nice seven, out of 10, I, that's my spot. And I'm gonna move that joint until that, that point I'm pushing on is either a one or a nothing, just pressure. I hold that position for 90, at least 90 seconds, and, uh, and then I return it back to that position. And it should still be pain-free. I do this a few times at several points. That joint I couldn't work anymore, I can work with it now. We can do some range of motion. We can maybe get them on a bike, get some activity going. Uh, hey, can I say yeah, something about that? Yeah. Um, I was, um, I with dealers Dan most dislocate things on a daily basis, and um, I had sprained my, my ankle very badly, and it was to the point where I, I feel like it, I can take a lot of pain, but this one was different. I thought for sure. Um, not only did I tear another ligament, but I was sure it, the pain was to the point where I may have evolved part of the bone off of the, the ankle. And I, I, I actually had to go on crutches, and for, for four weeks I was just in, in agony. Couldn't believe that it didn't show anything on the x-rays. He finally did... Um, technique he was just talking about, 10 minutes, pain gone, and I, I, I was a new woman from that point on, um, 
um, my RSD, he said we'll do it again tomorrow if, if it's still touchy and tender, but I didn't need even a second treatment. He moved it until I told him, no, I don't feel it anymore, and held it there and did his thing, and no more pain. It, it was just, it, it was incredible. What, what it does, it, it resets the pain or the, the, um, the nerve endings down in that area, it resets them so that you know, they're screaming to the brain that there's a ton of pain down here even though there's really not much going on there. It just gives them a way to just calm down, settle down a little bit, let's restart. Okay? Uh, Collins did a study, or uh, another case report, where uh, about a 13-year-old who had the RSD was unable to do any weight bearing, was complaining of 10 out of 10 pain. Collins got a hold of him, did an evaluation, and found out with tenor points he needed to find. Use strain, counter strain uh, for the first, and then followed the gait training. And what he found was that after each treatment, the pain levels were reduced to a two out of 10. It lasted about one to three days. At six months, the pain levels were down to zero, zero out of 10. So he's using this technique to help him get done what he needs to get done with this kid. The kid needs to get moving, he needs to exercise, he needs to get some function back. And this was just a tool that he was able to use to, to get that effect that he wanted. But he does note that, that the research is limited, um, but seeing these clinical changes, it does warrant further study. We have cranial sacral therapy. You know, this was developed by John Upledger. It's, he describes it as there's a cranial sacral rhythm in which the movement of the cerebral spinal fluid causes a predictable and palpable pulsation. And he's, he states that the restrictions of the cranial bones and the dura impede this motion and cause pain and somatic dysfunction. Now, this is a very highly debated technique. Um, you're going to have people on both sides of the argument, and they will fight to the death about this technique. Um, they've, there's studies that have shown that there's very low inner rate of reliability. So you get 16 craniosacral therapists in a room. They all measure the same person for that craniosacral rhythm. They don't come up with the same numbers. And then they have trouble repeating those, those numbers. Um, but uh, Yako and uh, Van Helmichel did a study, and they, or they reviewed several studies and found that you know people who were having this were were getting positive income or outcomes with it. So you know, is it working the way Upledger described it? There's nothing to prove it, but you can't you can't disagree with the the uh, clinical findings. So I say you know don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You got good techniques. If they're going to work, they're not doing any harm. If it helps you get that person to do something that you need them to do, if it relieves that headache or uh, helps their range of motion, it's I'm eight o'clock. Thanks, <laughs> um, It's going to help me get my get uh, done what I need to get done with them. And just because there's no evidence, it doesn't mean it's absent. So we don't know. We don't know why it works, but it, they should definitely do more research on it based on. Uh, the, the results are getting of clinical findings. One uh, craniosacral technique I use called the coccygeal lift. This works very well with the uh, Chiari people that come in. They come in with these headaches and the neck pain. And all I'm doing up by the head there, I've got, I'm palpating a tender spot, finding a tender spot at the upper cranial or the upper cervical spine. And then I'm going to uh, mobilize the uh, tailbone, pull it towards the head, and I rotate just a little bit. And so that tender point, it's a seven or a ten, seven, eight, nine, ten out of ten, drops down to again a one or a zero. And then I'm going to hold that position for 90, at least 90 seconds. Um, this works really well in, in just knocking that headache out so I can get something done with these people. Uh, for the therapist, Leon Chatel uh, has some really nice literature about how this works. Uh, other techniques, everybody. Hear about myofascial release? You know that it's a connective tissue technique. Um, there's one variant of it that I find extremely useful. It's called the three plane. Uh, that can be looked. At. Uh, there's a group in uh, Connecticut, the Center for Integrated Manual Therapy, that 
uh, did the three planar. They have some very good literature out there too that explains it. Uh, neural tension releases. It's shown right here. This is one example of it. This is a sitting slump test. We usually use that to rule out disc problems. The nice thing is that it takes up all the slack in the spinal cord and the sciatic. If someone comes in with a tiger cord surgery, they're still having some back issues. I'm going to put them in that. I'm going to have them move that, straighten that, and bend that knee back and forth. So what you're doing is you're taking the sciatic nerve. It's already on slack, and you're pulling it back and forth. You're mobilizing it inside the dural tube to help prevent any recovery. And then taping. Uh, we use the McConnell taping or kinesio taping. If anybody's watched the Olympics last summer and they saw the people with the tape, the big colorful tape, that's kinesio tape. It's just another way to help get things moving correctly. The one thing you have to watch out for with, with the Ehlers Danlos people is that there's some skin sensitivity. And then you have to gotta be careful with that. That's the only thing. Therapeutic exercise, we use uh, multi-angle isometrics. That's just, we're going throughout the range and we're resisting motion without them going, th we're not res resisting it this way, we're holding it there, and they push against us without any movement. Uh, rhythmic stabilization, so what I would do is I want to work uh, some more stability, I would just have her hold that position and not let me move it, and I would move in several different directions without her knowing which way I'm going. That helps retrain the, stability of the muscles to stabilize that joint. Uh, core strengthening, here's an example. You get your classic bridge. Uh, that helps work the abdominal muscles and, and the uh, low back muscles. Uh, one thing to consider is low to no car impact cardio. If someone that's got loose joints, do you really want to put them on a treadmill that's pounding, pounding, pounding on joints that are already sore? You know, we stick to... Uh, Incumbent bikes or aquatic therapy if it's available, that's really the best. And moderate intensity weight training. Too much weight can cause joint irritation. We want to strengthen them, we don't want to make them hurt more. But we do want to sometimes increase the muscle mass to help with the stability. Uh, considerations for therapists. You have to read your patient. Uh, there's so many things that are going on that could happen that you really need to watch their effect. You need to pay attention to how they're uh, exercising. If they look like they've had it, they're done. You know, you, we don't want to you know, make them worse. Uh, there may be cardiovascular, vestibular components. Uh, if they're on the exercise bike, you really gotta, you might want to have a blood pressure monitor near them. Uh, if, the, if they're having some uh, positional uh, blood pressure problems, we want to be aware of that. Um, and no pain, no gain, it doesn't apply. You know, we, we don't want them to hurt more. We're trying to get them less pain. Uh, and emphasize the stability within the normal anatomical motion. We want them to be stable the normal way the joint moves. And the regional interdependence we talked about before. Uh, so my take home messages, I got three. For the doctors, PT is just, it's not, we're not just exercising passive modalities. We have a lot of other options available to us. Therapists need to hone your skills. Uh, you see the classes, take them. If you see a class near you, jump on it. And keep an open mind. One tech, don't get stuck on just one technique. Uh, there's so many. You can beg, borrow, and steal from all different ones. It's not going to make you a bad therapist. You just want to keep your options open. And patients, PT is not a fix. All right? um, we're just there to help you manage your symptoms. We're trying to make things better, but you know, it, we can't fix it. Um, but we do want you to keep an open dialogue. Remember that no symptom is stupid. You know, we, I've had people come in, oh, you know, it's the stupidest thing. My elbow hurts. Or right, let's take a look at it. You know, and the next thing I know, oh, okay, well, that could be, you know, your elbow hurts. So now you, when you go to lift your coffee cup, you're going you know, like this. That's why your shoulder hurts. Yeah, it, I, it's important to know these things. So don't think that's stupid. So um, any questions? I know I went through an awful lot of stuff. Um, yeah. I have a question. Could you maybe demonstrate safe neck strengthening exercises? Um, like for those of us who have kids that like the writing is kind of on the wall, mm -hmm. what what they could do to strengthen muscles either in their shoulders, neck, core, whatever it might be that's safe. Yeah, um, there's the lay down, there you can do a laying down or, or standing. So if, if um, I want to do something very easy with the hole. 
just to work on some of the stabilizing. Use that rhythmic stabilization that I was talking about before. So and Dr. Henderson just did surgery on me about four and a half weeks ago. So this is a good time for me. I've been working on, um, recently I was able to get my collar off at four weeks. So it's only been six days of me really working on neck and muscle strengthening and stabilizing my head. So perfect question, perfect timing. <laughs> so if, if you wanted to work with your kids, you could just put a hand on each you know, part of their head and you could push back a little, very gently and just tell them to resist you. So just say, don't let me move your head. And, I, and I'm moving, I just moved her back, now I'm moving her to the left, now I'm moving her forward, and I'm just real gentle, you know, I'm not, and all it's doing is it's, it's just making the neck muscles push, I just want them to contract a little bit, just to get started. Um, anything more than that, it could be, you know, painful, it could cause the joints to, instead of stay stable, be a little slip, a little slip, you know, if you're pushing too hard, we don't want that, we want the joints to be stable. Okay. And I can do it. I do it myself. Right. You know, I just hold my hand there and gently push against it. And obviously at this point, my muscles are still feeling pretty weak. So I'm not pushing too hard, but my muscles, I, I know my body and I, I know how far I can go. And um, in a week, I'll be able to push a lot harder than I'm pushing right now. You can so use it's on the comfort zone. And, and as it gets more comfortable, you can move to like TheraBand. It's the rubber band, stretchy stuff. That's our physical therapy duct tape used for everything. That's what I was going to ask. So what, if you have one of those... You can put it around the, the head. In the door? Oh, in the yeah, door. Put it on your head. Just pull forward, pull sideways, oh. pull this way. You can attach it to a hat. If you want to make it fun for the kids. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's great. So, well, I was the warm-up act. So the main, the main uh, presentation here. Well, not just, just you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> that was. I think I learned more about physical therapy in that twenty minutes. Than, <laughs> thank you so much. <clears throat> that was really brilliant. It really was. I don't think there's a person in this room that isn't uh, really impressed with what you had to say. And uh, we, I think we all are going to start saying, well, try the Collins test <laughs> of <laughs> therapy. And um, well, Eric, uh, Nicole, uh, it's uh, amazing to have two brilliant people in one family. And, and uh, when I had Nicole as a patient just a month ago, first operatively, I, I realized just how bright she was uh, with all of these uh, very... Uh, insightful um, <clears throat> considerations about what was happening and she really does think on many different levels about uh, not, not just what's happening at the anatomical but also the cardiovascular and the endocrinologic and the hematologic and uh, for a physical therapist I thought her knowledge of medicine was actually pretty remarkable. Anyway, so Nicole is going to tell her story and this is very brave of me because I don't know what she's going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, I, I've received a lot of questions um, on the computer, what people would like me to talk about tonight. Um, I'm so, so many that I, I had to pretty much narrow it down into a couple of small sections. Um, but they do cover quite a bit. Um, first, I want to let you know who I am, um, you know, where I come from, and w what got me here at this podium today. Um, well, I'm 38 years old. I've, I've dealt with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome all my life since I was a little girl. Um, I started out with dislocating joints. I was really rough playing my sports. I was I was tough and competitive and, and didn't really care too much. I was just wanting to win. Um, I got used to the loose joints and people just said I was double jointed and I just put it back in place and kept on a plan. So uh, it didn't bother me too much at the time. Um, 
late, that actually led me to become a physical therapist because I, I had injuries so bad during my sports that I had to go to physical therapy on an outpatient basis and I saw what they did and I was like, wow, what a cool job this is. I can actually physically help people improve their quality of life. I can get them walking again normally even without pain. So that really intrigued me from a from a very young age, and I and I started really diving into to medicine before I even went to college. Um, uh, eventually, I started not just dislocating my joints but tearing ligaments to the point of needing surgery. My symptoms progressed in my twenties when I developed severe autonomic dysfunction. Um, anyone here have autonomic dysfunction? Yeah, yeah a couple. Okay, um, some of my uh, autonomic problems uh, affected my, my heart to the point where, and my blood pressure to the point where I started to get arrhythmia and my blood pressure <coughs> was going down. Sometimes my body would try to overcompensate and my blood pressure would shoot through the roof. I'd, being at work in a, in a hospital setting uh, for the 13 years I was, I started passing out while working with patients, and that's that's unacceptable. Yeah, my job was to help them get better and be safe while walking. And when this lady who looked like she was about 150 years old said, "Honey, you take my chair. You don't look so good." <laughs> when she said that to me, I thought, "Well, maybe it's time I be done." Um, at, at that time, um, I, I did leave work because I, it wasn't safe for me. Uh, my heart was getting worse, um, and I started to require a lot of surgeries for my joints. Um, I got a pacemaker for third-degree heart block, um, and since then, uh, I, I started um, from the four years ago when I quit work. Um, and since the pacemaker, I started to have neurological issues, and um, they included coordination and balance problems, speech and swallowing issues, nausea, and tension tremors, headaches, memory loss, That's the point I I couldn't remember my, my husband of almost 21 years. I couldn't remember his name uh, right before my surgery. But a certain someone came to my rescue. <laughs> and Dr. Henderson did um, a wonderful job um, doing a decompression infusion and um, started to recover uh, pretty much immediately. And it's been progression ever since. Um, well, 16 surgeries later, uh, two of them by Dr. Henderson, I realized that my purpose is not just to be a, a PT and to increase people's quality of life by helping them physically, although I did keep my license, as it is part of who I am, I believe. But now I know my purpose is to help others, uh, one, with my knowledge of physical therapy, too, by having empathy from the patient side because I've been through it all and I understand. And then three, to help raise awareness so that there are clinicians across the globe eventually who are capable of recognizing and treating patients with EDS and Chiari and other medical problems that right now aren't being recognized by the medical community as a whole. So that's my goal. Um, and right now, I, I, know, I know it's a, a little bit late, so I'll, I'll try to make it quick but get the point across. I, um, the two categories I, I chose to focus in on from the questions I got on, my, um, on the computer are um, to raise awareness, one on the medical front and then on the personal front. Um, raising awareness on the medical front, how to deal with medical professionals who don't seem to get it. 
and we'll be focusing on the wide spectrum of doctors, PTs, and other clinicians dealing with the gray area clinician, the importance of keeping an open mind with a clinician. It can be contagious. Signs that a clinician is worth giving a chance and when to run the other way. <laughs> All right, let's talk about the wide spectrum of clinicians. Um, what do you call a person who graduates last in his medical class? What did you say? Doctor, right, yeah. It goes for PT also. Um, so there aren't just good doctors and, and bad doctors. There are good clinicians and bad clinicians. They they go from the, spe the spectacular, like Dr. Henderson, all the way down to the close-minded, fly-by-night doctor. Um, but then there's the everywhere in between, and that's where I want to focus on. That, that has to be our goal as patients, to get the awareness out there. Um, as long as a clinician has an open mind, they have the potential to become a huge help and supporter of the EDS and CARI community. The importance of your role in dealing with the gray area clinician. If we want a clinician on board across the globe, it's up to us, the patient, to make that happen. We can't have people who are supporters and already know all about it, like Dr. Henderson, Dr. Frank Amano, the geneticists, and, and, and the doctors that were on the um, think tank, you called it, board uh, for CSF. We can't leave it up to them to get the awareness out there. There's only a handful of people that are so knowledgeable that they are needed to be helping us. So it's our job to go out and find more clinicians and get them aware, get them on board, and learn so that they can be the next spectacular ones and the ones who can treat us and, and make a difference in our lives. Um, remember, you have a voice. You know yourself better than anyone. Most of us, out of necessity, are more educated about our disorders than even the clinician. You may be their best resource, at, at least to start when you walk in the door, okay? Um, tell them all of your related symptoms, no matter how crazy it sounds. It just might Trick something, trigger something in their head to say, oh wait, oh, and then they start putting two and two together. I think we're onto something here. Y you never know. So just, I know our, we all know that when we go to a, a doctor that's never heard of EDS or Chiari and, and things like that, or never worked with a patient that has it, sometimes we get looked at like we have three heads and, and it's very invalidating. But just try. Try to keep an open mind for that doctor and, and just let them know everything that's going on. I, I actually, I went to the, the hospital one time um, when I tore uh, another ligament and I told the doctor, um, I, I said, uh, I, I have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. He said, Oh, yeah. He said, I, I remember learning about that in college. I thought that would be the coolest disorder to have. <laughs> and <laughs> I looked at him, and as he's, you know, looking at what's going on with me, and at the time I still had my neck brace on, and there I am with my crutches, and, and he saw the look on my face, and he said, but now I realize it must not be so cool to have. <laughs> Good answer. Okay, so uh, don't be afraid to ask and give feedback regarding your treatment plan. Be a part of that. Keep an open mind. It can be contagious, just like smiles. And these are my two lovely children, Casey and Haley. Um, when you keep an open mind with a doctor, and this is very important because... I know we know our bodies best. We may think that we know exactly what's going on, uh, 
what's causing the problem that you're there for, but that that might not be true. I, something else could be going on. So you have to keep an open mind with the doctor, okay? Let them know what's going on. Give them all the facts, but go ahead and brainstorm if you can together, all right? Don't just say, this is what I think is going on, and if the doctor says, no, I, I don't think that's it at all, well, maybe he has reasons for that. Just keep an open mind with that gray area clinician. Don't you want to keep it on that one? Oh, that's so cute. <laughs> All right. Signs of the clinician is worth giving a chance. Okay. Um, the good clinician, um, a good clinician, is not afraid to say, I don't know. I, I respect those clinicians more than I can tell you um, because they're the ones that are willing to find out. A good clinician listens to all of your concerns and thoughts on its relationship to your underlying disorder. A good clinician will accept literature references and other clinicians' numbers who are willing to assist in your care on the case. If they have tried but realize it's currently beyond their capability, they will say as much and help refer you to someone they feel is better qualified. If they do come up with a plan of care, they will not be afraid to offer you a second opinion, just to be sure. Um, I, I was extremely amazed after um, Dr. Henderson, the, the first time um, that we looked over my, my scans and um, to see what was going on. And um, my, my grandpa always taught me measure twice, cut once. And Dr. Henderson measured my clavoaxial angle, swear to God, four times, just to be sure. And it went over all the rationale of what's going on, why he came up with the plan of care that he did, what, what he plans on doing, the risks, the benefits, the whole nine yards. But I really want you to get a second opinion so you're sure that this is the choice you, you want to make. That's a good doctor not afraid to say check it out i you know if that's i want you to be comfortable okay because the other one if they're a good doctor they will see the same things they will measure that four times and they will do the exact same thing they will come up with the same plan of care when a clinician may not be suited to help you um they don't want to discuss anything other than your chief complaint, exactly what you're in there for, mm -hmm. nothing other than that. They may show defensiveness or, uh, when you question them or try to <coughs> offer your thoughts or when you try to offer your thoughts on what's going on in your body. They don't want to hear that. They just want to talk about the one reason you came in that day. Mm -hmm. um, they won't accept references or phone numbers to help in the case. <laughs> you know, it's, you recognize that? <laughs> um, so the, the problem with this is uh, I know there's a lot of people out there that live far away from really, really good doctors. You know, us being in that, in that category. Sometimes you don't have the ability to, to pick up and, and fly out across the country to get to the doctor that you want to see. You might want to give that doctor, even though his bedside manner is very poor, a second chance. You never know. Maybe he was having a bad day. Maybe he's got a poor bedside manner, but he's very intelligent. Go back in and assertively yet kindly go back over the things that you wanted that you did the first time that you were there and see what happens that second time they they may come around they may have thought about it and the wheels were turning y you never know you just don't want to judge because we, we all have bad days and, and 
things go wrong. So um, th that's just if, if you don't have the resources to get to a doctor that might be able to help you better, okay? Um, then raising awareness on the personal front. Um, like uh, clinicians, there's a spectrum. Uh, before you expect others to validate you, be sure that you have reached a level of radical acceptance yourself. Who do you put your energy into educating? These are the things we're going to talk about. What if your concern is for a family member's health and they seem to be in denial? You got your disorder, possibly, if you have Ehlers-Danlos, you got it from genetics. Maybe you're worried about your parent or a sibling and you're afraid for their safety, their well-being. How do you deal with talking to them about the disorder when they say, you're fine, I'm fine, everything's fine. They're, they just don't want to touch the subject. And then, um, most importantly, this came up a, a lot for questions, is the guilt trip. Dealing with those who, in your family or your, your circle, uh, dealing with those who <coughs> outwardly invalidate you. So, in the spectrum on the personal front, and first there's the spectrum in relation to the importance to you for them to get it. It goes from maybe a significant other or a parent, they're the most important to you that they get it all the way down to your co-workers or acquaintances. Um, in relation to their willingness to listen, there's a spectrum from the Google crazy people all the way down to the you're fine, everyone gets tired, everyone has this once in a while, just they, they don't want to hear that there, there's actually a diagnosis, a word for the problem. And it's perfectly natural to remember as, as a human being to want validation from everyone for whatever it is we're going through. I feel the most important thing before getting others to validate you is for you to validate yourself. And this is called radical acceptance. It's knowing that no matter what anyone says or does, doesn't change the facts. It doesn't make you a wimp a hypochondriac or an attention seeker. The fact is you have a disorder that is extremely complex, unrecognized by the majority of the medical community, making it difficult to treat. It's debilitating a great deal of the time and it has changed many or all aspects of your life. And radical acceptance is difficult to achieve. And so it takes practice. You have to keep reminding yourself that when someone invalidates you. I have this disorder. These are the symptoms that go with it. I am not a wimp. This is what this, yeah, this is what I'm dealing with. It's, it's not, it's not them. It's me. Because <laughs> it is. It's, it's, it's what's going on in your body. And that's the fact. All right, what if you feel a family member is at risk of having the disorder? Um, first of all, you try to talk to them. Remind them that you're acting out of concern. Explain the benefits of having an evaluation and the risks of not getting treatment if they do have the disorder. Ultimately, it's their body and therefore it's their choice and, and you do need to respect that at the end of the day. It's like a a cancer patient who doesn't want chemo and the doctor says if you get chemo <coughs> this will I don't know, cure the cancer or get rid of it or give you another how many years or whatever it's a lot of patients say no I I don't want chemo I I don't want to go through that I I just want to live out my days it's their it's their body it's their choice as long as you try to talk to that loved one or, or friend, you just have to respect that that's their choice. Um, and last is the guilt trip. 
from the people who are high on the list of importance to you, but low on the willingness spectrum. All right. For example, the one who gives you grief or makes a fuss in front of others about you because you didn't stay for cake or because you couldn't make it to a family function, yet again. I'm, I'm extremely fortunate because my entire family and all my friends understand what's going on with me and, and they validate it and I, I get, no, actually, I, mine's the opposite. Maybe you should go lay down. You don't look so good. You're a little pale. How you feeling? You know, and I need to say, I'm good. I'm, I'm good. I'm fine. Thanks. You know, so it mine's the, the opposite problem. <laughs> um, so you want to, for, for that person, you want to ask to set aside time to talk without distractions about something that's important to you. You may choose to have a support person with you, maybe your spouse or your significant other, or even your your best friend that that does get it and knows how much help and, and support you need. Um, uh, sorry, I just I'm still four weeks out of surgery. Sometimes I just go blank for a minute. <laughs> it's getting better though. <laughs> Um, did I already say explain why it's important for them to understand? No? Sorry about that. <laughs> All right. So you, you do want to say that, why, why it is important for you. you. You may need help at home with the kids. You, maybe it's your parent and you just really want them to come around and, and treat you like they used to treat you. And, and just love you for who you are no matter what disorder you have um, and accept when you can't go to that family function or stay for that cake and that you need to go home and lay down it's tough managing and I could sure use your support you could say something like that try to validate their feelings I understand this is scary stuff I'm scared too um, Use words like when you, X, Y, Z, it makes me feel, however. Well, it's not helpful to use words like you always or you never. Put it in terms of how it feels to you when they do a, or say a certain thing. Um, stick with the facts. Offer educational tools to fit their style best, whether it be just talking it out, going on the internet together, maybe they're an internet person, watching a video. Um, and then if it's a no-go, you tried your best, and then you gotta go back to reminding yourself that you can't change what anyone does. You can only change how you react to it. All right? And I, I think that's um, where, I, I, where I'm gonna go from here is um, I, I'm going to continue in every way I possibly can to help raise awareness for Chiari and Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, and I'm going to do it by offering help and suggestions uh, as a therapist and as someone who's been through it, lend me ear, and raise money in any way I can, and get the word out there. So if anyone has any ideas or questions or just wants to talk here's our contact information eric and i are 110 percent on board with with anything that we can do okay. we just really wanted to thank you guys for inviting us yes down thank you so much and, you know it, it really is a testament to how hard you guys are working with the uh, the Kiari websites and the Healers and Animals websites. I just started doing the networking, and I can't believe how many people are offering each other advice. Oh, I know this, and I can help with this. You guys are really amazing. You really keep it up. Work hard. Keep working on. I have one comment. You guys are talking about like just talk about every little system to clinicians. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many doctors I've seen because I can't eat anything at one particular time. Like mm -hmm. my stomach load was like a banana. Mm -hmm. for 10 years. 
I started seeing a certified manual functional therapist in Annapolis just happened to fall into her through my knee surgery or head surgery, but been followed. And she found the problem to my stomach. And I sat down for the first time in two years on Thanksgiving and ate two plates of food. And wow. she was this, I mean, she worked with my stomach on some. She did a visceral mobile. Yeah. yeah. She did. Yeah. And it was unbelievable. I mean, I couldn't believe it. And I cooked two years <coughs> worth of food, which I haven't done for two years. It's my accident. Wow. So, mention everything all the time to you just now. Right. You're right about that. Yeah. Yeah, mention it all. I had a question for you, Eric, before you got down. But um, one of my problems with a lot of joints, but I'll use the neck for an example, is um, before I had the surgery that your wife had, um, Dr. Henderson told me about the neck exercises you can do um, to press. Do you you know, isometric. Isometric. Yeah. isometric exercises. And... Um, you know, with the laxity, the issue that I have is before the muscle even has a chance to activate properly, the joint slides. And so before surgery, it didn't do anything anyways because I felt like I was pushing my head around. Right. And the muscles, once they feel the instability, if anything, they just deactivate because it's their response to the instability. Right. And I have that with my SI joint. I have that with my, you know, yeah. a lot of other joints too. And Right now, yes, I have the fusion from skull to C2, but um, experiencing the same problem with C3, C4, C5. Right. They slide, no chance to activate, yeah. spasm, and deactivation. There's, you know, you, the ligaments are what help keep things moving correctly in a passive way. There's no way you can have an effect from the outside on a ligament as far as exercise because it's a non-contractile tissue. Muscle, you can there's a way that um, if you take it back one step from the isometrics, if you're talking about cervical, you can actually use the eyes to initiate muscle contraction without even doing an isometric. You would just lay on your back and you look up and you just put a little pressure down as you're looking up and then when you look down, you pull up. So you're moving your hand in the opposite direction of the eye so you can do it left and right. When you move your eyes, if you go to turn your head, the first thing you do is you look with your eyes. As you turn, I'm looking to the left. What it'll do is there's a reflex that causes the tiny uh, intervertebral muscles to contract first. Those are the stabilizers. They're going to kind of set that, that spine before you actually start to move it. So there is one step backwards from an isometric. You can do that. Mm -hmm. But as far as trying to, you know, other joints, um, sometimes the therapist has to troubleshoot. You know, if you find one thing that doesn't work, okay, you just have to find someone that says, all right, I'm going to this isn't working, I need to go back two steps, or I need to go forward two steps. It's, therapy is sometimes more art than science, you know, it's, it's more like cooking. You Are know? you able to get through the day without wearing your collar? Are your muscles strong enough and have the endurance to get through a whole day without a, putting on a aspen collar? Or? Um, not really, no. <laughs> no. It's kind of complicated, but I mean, um, yeah. I know that in other joints too, like with the SI joint and the hips, you know, if you, a lot of the physical therapy, I do know how to manually put everything put back, back in the place, but, down. you know, two minutes, two seconds later, it slides right back out again. You know? There's no, um, there's no resol real resolution even with manual, you know, muscle energy techniques to push things, uh, get the muscles to really push things back in. And then when you go to move the joint to exercise the muscles surrounding it, it's already out before you even get to the place of using the muscles that you're trying to work. Right. And then you're working muscles that you're strengthening that are using the joint without it being in alignment at that point. Mm -hmm. Then you've got all kinds of muscles activating, trying to compensate, and you're not accomplishing the physical therapy that you were intending to accomplish because everything's reacting. Right. Well, don't put your leg in the, in what you said is really important. You said you put your leg in a position and already where you want the muscle to work and already it's out, don't don't move your leg. Keep it where it's comfortable and where it's in place. You could do isometrics at that exact spot. I, I have the instability too in the in the because I'm cranium to C two also and and I'm a Bob will have my um, C three and down they slip out of place and can get caught up on the facets. Now, when I do my isometrics, I, you know, I only give as, as much as I think I, I can. Some days, um, well, right now, it's about 
ten percent, you know, and that's appropriate. Like if I were to push as hard as I could, that's a hundred percent push. I might just push ten percent. It doesn't sound like anything. It doesn't sound like it's gonna get you there. And you're like barely pushing against your hand. But just think about the fact that too, even if you don't do that, keeping your head up everything's working hard at getting strong. I still have to put my collar on, on and off, because it's, it's only been a week now since I could take it off. So I put it on and off throughout the day, and my muscles get really tired just in the times that it's, that it's off. And, that, and that's enough exercise in itself. You have to measure your expectations, too. I, I know she has a horrible time. She tells me all oh, I should be going up and down those stairs 15 times. I'm like, just have neck surgery. <laughs> you know, relax. And I'm Start like, with, but my legs are fine. Well, yeah, not really, but they're good enough. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's, you have to, um, you know, whatever you can accomplish, that's your baseline. That's where you're going to start. And if you can operate in that baseline just to get a little better at that baseline, then you just take baby steps. You know, if you can't do an isometric, don't do an isometric. You know? Do you have any comments on prolotherapy? Um... And what, ther what therapy? Probo therapy. Um, you, for like trigger point injections? Um, where they they inject in to try to heal the ligaments that are... Oh, with the, with the sa or the sugar they, sucrose yeah, so solution? They, they can okay. use saline, they can yeah. use saline. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a 50-50 thing. Uh, there's been some... I've seen some articles that had said that, you know, it was, it was good and others that didn't. There's really not a whole lot of research on it. Not good research. You know, they're doing five or six people in a case study. So, you know, I think as that becomes more accepted in the medical community, because some people think it's just voodoo. Um, I don't, mm -hmm. I honestly, I, I'm on the There's fence. There's a lot of things that can send blood to the area. Yeah. Like heat, even heat will um, vasodilate to the blood vessels around it and bring it's, up. Yeah, it's caused like an inflammatory response right. that then promotes triggers healing. And then the yeah. healing supposed to strengthen the ligament. Yeah, and again, the studies, the research isn't there yet. They're mm -hmm. using uh, platelets also. Yeah. Oh. Platelet injections. So I have a really she big comment on prolotherapy. So on prolotherapy on a normal, uh, let's just say normal, healthy connected tissue, you have a better result. But when you're injecting into connected tissue that's genetically unsound, you're producing more genetically unsound tissue. So from what I, my understanding is that the EDS people that I know that have tried prolotherapy, it's been a big waste of money, but nobody ever looked at the thought that you're injecting into unsound tissue and you're getting more unsound tissue. So it's just something to think about. Yeah, it's again, more research needs to be done. I know they're doing the research on the prolotherapy in Florida. I know there's a couple of clinics down there doing that, but are they on EDS patients? Are they no? They're actually using yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, you know, I had a, a patient that had a um, she had a SC joint repaired. They took her own ligaments. They did an autograft. Why would you take ligaments for someone who's got EDS and put it? Yeah. Why don't you, wouldn't, wouldn't you get it from like a cadaver or something? And she's had nothing but trouble with it ever since. It's still, and, and then we'll go back and do it again. So I had one other thing I was going to ask um, before she brought the SI joint. So I had problems with my right SI joint and for two years and then found out through my manual physical therapist that I'm hypermobile on one side and it's getting worse because the other side is hypomobile. Right. So how often in your... That's a lot like me. My yeah. my right always goes out, my right SI, but it's never my left. And so do you find that you're, well, she's trying to tell me the reason that I'm having more mobility and more, developing more hypermobility in my right side was because I was hypomobile on my left side and I did not know it. And it showed up actually in my leg, and that's how we found out. That's my big toe, and I traveled all the way up. And then, yeah. you, you have, you have uh, EDS, yeah. what kind? Hypermobile. Yeah. But I'm not um, I, I would, yeah, I definitely would not try to start mobilizing the other side, that's for sure. I'd want to stabilize by strengthening up. The one thing you got to remember, the too, is that if, if the one, side. sorry, I'm talking over you. 
One side is um, hypermobile or hypomobile. The body has to make up for that motion somewhere. That's why you see when this, the fusions in the C spine, then you start seeing C3, C4 becomes more hypermobile. Well, you just lost 40, you know, half your motion in your neck. It's got to be made up somewhere. So you're going to start seeing more effects lower. If you see someone, let's say someone's walking, their foot is hypermobile. They're not getting uh, dorsiflexion. So they're, when they're walking, they're, when they push off, they're vaulting. Okay? So you start to see the body has to compensate for that somewhere. Usually it's at the hip or in the SI joint. That's when that pelvis shifts up. <coughs> and so they may look like they're walking normal, but when I'm walk, watching them, I don't see that push off. Oh, okay, that's hyper or hypomobile down there, which is causing a hypermobility up here. No, so you're, uh, you just have to balance it out. That's and that's the tricky part. You, know, you need someone that has to troubleshoot it. You're right-handed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what I've done is um, when you do th try not to do vacuuming or raking things vacuum. that you, you don't. Uh, Good. My son does it. Good. Okay. Because <laughs> I was going to say that's take me down. Yeah. <laughs> that's the the worst thing you could do. Um, uh, do you do certain exercises or activities on a regular? Well, I used to hike, and I actually was doing really well, and then okay. I started having problems with my left toe. Uh -huh. Then I had problems with my left knee. A year later, I had problems with my left groin, all continuing. And then my knee surgeon, which I've never had surgery, sent me to this physical therapist, and she said it's your SI to and cut and all that. It's yeah. a lot of work. I mean, it's probably because all those yeah. things on the left side, you were, yeah, you were compensating to keep this feeling better. And yeah. you'd be surprised how many people have SI problems, even yeah. non ehlers downs yeah. I mean, yeah. but with ehlers downs yeah. it really stinks. I, mean, I, <laughs> I can have five or six worries. back patients come in and they all got SI dysfunction. Yeah. There's something wrong with the pelvis, you know, and so nobody looked at that. Like, well, it's off. Really, trust me. And when they fix it and they're walking normal, they're like, wow, yeah, it feels a lot better. You didn't touch my back. And it's, yeah, no, it wasn't in the back. But. When I started PT four years ago, I had a lot of one sided pain. And when they started fixing the alignment problems in my pelvis with the SI joint, it was primarily on my left side. But as they started fixing those malalignments, every time I went into PT, and getting everything back into balance, it would make me more susceptible to going out again, except I would go out on the other side. So it was almost like one side was locked up while the other side was free and causing all these problems. And as soon as they fixed that locked up side, yeah, tried to balance it off, it made it an unstable environment again because nothing was locked out anymore. And then it would actually switch sides completely, and I would get all kinds of right-sided pain. They'd fix the right side. It would make me more susceptible again, and it might switch completely over to the left yeah. side. That, that's definitely something so, Eric learned early on to help me. Yes. So she might have one side that's locked up right now, where the other side is free and looks hypermobile, but if, they, if that really got ultimately fixed, it might actually end up switching sides. If it's pathologically locked up on that side, you could... I mean, get that checked out because there's, if if you're you're saying you're hypomobile on the left side, and hyper on the right. Yeah, but if if you're hypomobile to, um, to me, it, I mean, is it a normal amount? Like, like say you compared to someone without EDS, is it? Would that be considered hypomobile to the non EDS or? She thinks it is hyper hypermobile to the non EDS or like I Oh so like a pathological like it's locked up. It's, yeah. It's too hypermobile. She doesn't even know for about EDS. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. She's yes. never had a connected tissue, but she's very open minded and she oh, okay. has her that well, um that's, the yeah. CMFT from the people up at the physical institute of medicine. Oh. It's that's up in New York. Do you know what I'm talking about? Certified manual physical therapist. Yeah, they, yeah. I heard them. Okay. I don't know them personally. They're there and they're in. in uh, yeah, it's, if it's pathological, yeah, definitely. I think I said back and um, get it mobilized to a, a normal 90 DS or baseline range.
That's what she's trying to do. And that's what she's saying is causing yeah. Yeah. the oh, it's very excessive helpful. hyper on the side. And I'm, I'm not, um, I don't have any extra, I mean I do, but it's, mm -hmm. I've never dislocated anything except mm -hmm. ribs. Yeah. Nothing else is ever dislocated. Oh yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. 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 And they can break things when they come out. Ribs, you got to be careful. Yeah. 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 Is there a resource for our current physical therapists where we could send them to say, hey, go learn these techniques and let me be your guinea pig and there's, learn um, how to do this stuff together? Yeah. You know, there's several different continuing ed uh, groups that teach these techniques all throughout the country. Um, Northeast seminars. I think cross country is actually um, they have a, a seminar for muscle energy techniques. So um, and have them watch this video. That all I just get listed them six that I use like all the time. Research those techniques. Yeah. That's uh, get them started there. They don't have to go anywhere for it. They don't have to pay any money to do it. They can yeah, just I mean, sit there at their laptop and look through it. Sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> well, can I just? So th this has been really an extraordinary evening, both of you together. And, uh, and uh, our next uh, meeting is on April the 24th. It'll be a week later than the usual, Wednesday, April the 24th. And we haven't uh, selected the topic yet. But um, it, 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 there's no way it could be as good as this one. Oh, come on now. <laughs> Thank you all very much for coming. We'll See you next time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you everybody. Thank you.